Hi and welcome back to a new video. Today we will finish our retro build if everything works out. As you can see the bundle is already assembled with the 270-800 GTs. That's what I only did for shooting the thumbnail of the previous video. But in today's video I'm planning to finish the build. Similar to what we did already in the last video, we now have to test if the two VGAs are also working because those 7800 GTs are also quite old, 17 years old now. And I'm not sure if they're working out fine. So first quick check if they deliver a display signal. Well at least talking about the LEDs in the fan, yeah, it's not the brightest day they have. But as you can see, straight display signal from the first card. And also on the second card, no problem whatsoever, straight display signal. Now the thing is we tested the entire bundle with a Seasonic PSU because I wanted to be sure that the PSU and everything is working. We don't want to cause any like artificial problems. But back then in my system, I was using this kind of PSU. Um, Tagen, Tagan, whatever, I don't know how to pronounce this brand, but I was using like almost identical PSU, also an EasyCon series PSU, I think same wattage even. That was one of the first PSUs or like that was the area when it started that some of the PSUs were becoming modular when it comes to the cables. So it took me quite a while to find an identical PSU and after I purchased it I figured out that the cables are missing. But no problem at all, I just continued shopping, spent a bit more time and then purchased this PSU. The PSU is from the same vendor, again, but it's one generation younger and I actually also owned this PSU, but for the system I built afterwards. So after the Socket 939 system, I owned a dual Socket F system and in there I had exactly this one, but with a higher wattage. What I loved about this PSU series was the style of the connector they used. Not only that they also had some kind of RGB, not really RGB because you could not control it, but you had some green, red and blue lights on the connectors. And the connectors were also quite special. You can see those are the cables that were included and I have to totally admit, even looking at them today, the quality after this time feels amazing. Like, the plastics are still in a very good shape and honestly, if you look at these connectors, I know it's the wrong color, which should not matter, but you were supposed to connect it like this and then you had the threaded ring in there to fix it. And I think like even looking at connectors nowadays, I think this is, this is awesome. This is even better than the connectors which we see today, it kind of it's more like an industrial style better than these I think. At least it looks a bit better and it feels a bit higher quality. Not sure what the like power rating and thing is on these connectors but that was actually quite cool. The moment when you're building inside a very old case you immediately notice what kind of like huge benefit you have in a modern case. Even the cheap ones, the modern cases are so much more friendly when it comes to cable management because on here you can see the back wall is like directly on the mainboard tray so there's no way you can hide any cables behind it that's always yeah, a bit difficult you always have to squeeze in cables somewhere to the right in those HDD or like optical drive cages. Also yeah, I'm missing some standoffs for mainboard mounting, but that should be okay. It's mounted with six screws right now, so that should be okay. So the mainboard will not fall off. And I also left those cold cathodes in there. I hope they're blue. And then, yeah, that should also be a kind of flashback thing because that's what you used like 15 years ago. Nobody is using this anymore, obviously, because LED light is so much better. Considering the limited possibilities of the case when it comes to cable management, I think I did a quite well job. Should be sufficient for airflow well, some kind of airflow. This also shows what kind of bad airflow you had back in the days. Like the only intake we had is the front fan and then we have the VGAs sitting on here. They have the fan here, so the intake is on the bottom and they push out warm air like in the opposite direction of the front intake fan. And then we have the CPU cooling fan above with exhaust to the rear and also fan inside for the PSU. So yeah, like air cooling wise, because there's like no intake from the bottom for the VGAs, that was thermally speaking, definitely not great. And for those of you who might be quite young, these long connectors with the pins inside are IDE connectors for your HDD. I will not use an HDD today simply because that would be torture and why should I torture myself? That's not going to be a nice experience. It's just going to extend your loading times in games and installations and stuff. 
I will try to use one of these older SSDs I have. It still has an XP on it. Not sure if this XP will work out fine with the system. I will try. Worst case, I will have to reinstall a fresh XP. Okay. The first situation, it's okay. I mean, it's up and running, it's a bit loud, but as far as I remember, those cards have always been quite noisy. So that's probably just normal and we are probably spoiled from nowadays cooling units that are much more quiet, but you can see systems up and running and could also be because it's still stuck in the BIOS confirm F1 state that that's maybe why they're still running at high RPM. The thing is with this fan controller in front, this seems to be kind of broken. It's cool that if you tune it up, it's changing color. That's kind of a neat feature. But for whatever reason, this channel at least is not working. This channel for the fan down there is working fine. So I can spin this up to like 100%, but then it's also getting a bit more noisy. Oh yeah. But I think this, that's, that's fine. That should be fine cooling wise. But also, as you can see, the lights, the lights are not working so far. Or maybe, maybe these buttons were for lights. Huh. Oh, shit. <laughs> that is definitely, <laughs> that is a PC 2003. Oh my God. But it also looks kind of cool. Not even mad. We still have the side panel and if I remember correctly, this 80mm fan would also be blue illuminated, so it would fit the style of the PC, but then Vanessa is too tall. She's just too tall. We will have to remove the fan to install the side panel. She is just checking if the airflow is uh, working out correctly. She has a strong addiction eating some kind of plastics. Chic. Finally, time to install a proper OS. That's obviously not the original XP installer. As you can see on top, it's from 2013. But this way, it's very convenient, even nowadays, to install Windows XP using a USB flash drive. So that's the part you might know, but yeah, it's a German OS, so yeah. Now I only have to wait for the actual installation, and then I obviously have to get the drivers, install the drivers, so that will take a bit of time. Perfect, activating SLI worked out as well. For a first orientation and quick test, I'm running Cinebench, but not R20 or R23, but 11.5. So that's a bit more of a legacy version of Cinebench, but it's a bit more recent, so still comparable to recent CPUs because you can still run it. And yeah, as you can see, this will take forever because in the end, our 4200 plus is still just a dual core. Both cores are running at 2.2 gigahertz. But if you just check in core temp, you can see we have a lot of headroom for overclocking because even under load, and this has been running for maybe like two minutes already, we're not even hitting 50 degrees Celsius on the core. By the way, the memory is running at 400 megahertz and CL 2.5. Only one gigabyte installed. But even if you would ask like, can we not upgrade this to like four gigabyte? You have to keep in mind, this is a 32 gigabyte OS, which means that we are limited to about 3.5 gigabyte. And you also have to account for the graphics memory. We have dual GPUs, which means that we also have to take into account that we have 512 megabyte in addition of video memory. And the result we got is not even one point, it's 0 0.95 points. And to give you a perspective, a 5800X has about 30 points. So it's more than 30 times faster than this CPU. Yeah, and the classic thing that happened back then, I was playing around a bit with overclocking and I initially straight bricked the Windows XP installation. So I have to like repair it if it's possible. Check disk did its magic so I can continue with the overclock and uh, yeah, so far 10%. For overclocking, we're doing everything out of the BIOS and that's 
basically also the only chance or possibility we have. We go to jump free configuration and I increased uh, the reference clock and that's also interesting because it's listing CPU frequency but it's not the CPU frequency, it's like the reference clock. And the reference clock is going up from 200 to 232, so it's a 16% overclock. I also increased PCI Express clock by 15% to give a bit more bandwidth to the dual GPUs. CPU multiplier is still maximum and also CPU voltage is kept at 1.5 volt. That's the max we can use on this board. There are also pin mods you can do on uh, socket 775 and 939 where you basically connect some pins with tiny wires which allow to have an offset voltage and increase the voltage further but that would be probably be too much for this video. Only thing we also still have to do is especially adjust the HT link. I decrease this to a multiplier of 2 otherwise the system wouldn't boot. And you also have to make sure that your memory speed is not exceeding what your memory is capable of. My memory is not the fastest and if I would boot at this divider of 400, which is basically stock, but if we increase the reference clock, then it's clocking a bit higher, wouldn't boot, so I had to lower it to 333. The CPU is now running at 2.55 GHz, the memory is almost at the same uh, speed as what we were running stock, so there's certainly headroom for optimization, but we increased from 0.95 to 1.15 points. That is an increase of like 17 or 18 percent. And this was one of the cool things you could do back then because let's say the 4200 plus was clocking stock at 2.2. And then for example you also had the 4400 plus or 4600 plus and the 4600 plus alone was clocking at 2.4 gigahertz and this is clocking 2.5 which meant that back then you could easily save like 200 euro by just overclocking your system you had to spend a bit of time debugging a bit of testing but typically within a day you were able to to save like 200 euro so that was great and that was pretty much the origin of overclocking and the reason why a lot of people got into overclocking and then after several years obviously the manufacturers like AMD and Intel they figured out that people are saving money which meant that they are losing money and uh, that's the reason why nowadays you cannot typically gain performance from one skew to another they're artificially blocking things or like creating skews so this is not possible anymore unfortunately Apart from the CPU, there's obviously also headroom for overclocking on the GPUs. We're using Riva Tuner for that to make sure that Riva Tuner will be working with the like newer driver version. Because I'm using 197.45. You will have to go to power user, then open this tab and then enter the driver version into forced driver version. And then you can also utilize Riva Tuner with more recent drivers. Overclocking can be done clicking on this icon. And then it's always important because stock standard 2D is always selected. And we go to performance 3D because we want to adjust the 3D clock. And then we can easily drag those two sliders for adjusting both GPU and memory clock. And you can also see it's getting picked up correctly. We could in theory also adjust the fan speed, but for whatever reason on my card, it's always running on 100%, no matter if I go to auto or like direct control. And yeah, not sure about that, but it's already running 100%, so that's a max cooling. The final result is 470 megahertz on the core and 1170 megahertz on the memory, resulting in 11,853 points. The cool thing is with these 11,800 points, that was a top of the line system in 2005 because you were actually beating, let's say, a configuration of a 4600 plus and dual 7800 GTX. So yeah, those were the much 
well, better cards when it comes to cooling, also much more expensive cards. But performance-wise, because we clocked from 400 to 470 megahertz on the GPU, that's an additional like 17%. And in combination with the another 17 or 18% on the CPU, that was a significant performance increase. And this way you could get the cheaper CPU, the cheaper GPU, and have the same kind of performance as a high-end system. And that's, yeah, that was one of the like roots of overclocking where everything started and why a lot of people originally came into overclocking. Back then, it was not just a 12900K or like 5950X. It was the cheap CPU and the cheap GPU and a bit of effort, which allowed you to get free performance. Yeah, it's a bit sad that it's not like that anymore. Yeah. But I still enjoyed building my retro system and we can continue this, we can modify it, play with different CPUs, different GPUs, I have a huge collection. So if there's anything you'd like to see, please let me know in the comments. And thanks for tuning in, see you next time, bye bye.